been wanting to fast, so I'm going to give you a fast today, 14 days. We're going to take 14 days as of tomorrow, Monday, and you will not eat after 6 o'clock. You will burn. Hallelujah. I, I have been asking God, how should we do this? And uh, so this is how we're going to do it. If you can fast after 6 o'clock every day, take a little time to pray. That's all we need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to make sure to start this up to death because Christ is with us. After six, drink something nourishing if you want to, but let's refrain from eating. Now, some of y'all, that's going to be hard to do while you're looking at your favorite TV show, while you used to munch, or you come in like me at nine o'clock, and you eat at nine. I'm really going to suffer with that. I'm going to miss supper usually. But I just want to encourage you. That's a good time to find God and to pray and to discipline yourself in Him. Hallelujah. So how many of y'all agree with that as a church? Good, hallelujah. You know, uh, I, I like to say that when we started our church here, uh, we had our first service in Cambridge in a house that we rented that flooded when it rained. A little rain flooded that house. But we lived in this house and we loved it. And our first meeting was actually January 3rd and only Leon was there. Leon was everywhere. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> And we're thankful to him. I call him First Fruits because our family was called to be down here. And Mr. Victor is the other person that we knew from the beginning. And Leon was in that service. And the next week, uh, we, we call it the week we really started because that's when I decided, you know what? It doesn't matter what nobody else say. I'm starting this church. Yes. Because I had a lot of opposition. Yes. Unbelievably so. Mm. And so on the 10th was when I made my heart up that this is what it's going to be exactly what God told me to do. And so what you see, it was not born because of generations or people had an idea or somebody wanted an organization. It was born out of our hearts. And on the 10th, I think Janelle was at that next meeting with Leon. And on the 17th, the pastor I was under finally decided, I'm going to send you out. I was already thinking, I don't care if you do or not, God already did. Hallelujah. But he laid hands, sent me out. He said, but don't go, go to New Orleans and start your church. So it's, you know, the name of it was Chapter 2 was Chapter, so it's automatic that he would think I should go to New Orleans. And we tried our best to go to New Orleans, just like little obedient little children. Mm -hmm. When in our hearts we knew that these are the people we were called for. Mm -hmm. And we walked the streets of New Orleans Sunday after Sunday, day after day, saving to get a building, yep. trying to get in New Orleans. And one day my wife and I were passing this very property here, not with a dime in our pockets. And the Lord told us to stop. And there was a cardboard sign sitting on a piece of, <laughs> piece of stick. Say, for a sale. And the Holy Spirit said, buy that. You, I've told you the story. Went to the bank. The bank pretty much told us, are you kidding? Y'all got, got too many bills. Got too much going on. We can't afford to buy nothing. And I was really like, but God, you told us to do this. We don't hustle and fill out the papers and and it's done all the incorporation, got all the IRS stuff done, and we're working really hard, pressing in. And one day, this young, this man, when I went to the bank, he said, uh, can I talk to you? And he just looked at me and said, you know what? I'm the vice president here. I will approve this loan. Amen. Amen. Something tells me I can trust you. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. God's favor. Say God's favor. Amen. Amen. That's a lifetime. Hallelujah. At the closing, my wife and I sit up there like, man, we got all this stuff to do. What if this church doesn't work out? We ain't got no money. We ain't, and look, she, she just, she, she and Leon both are kind of. got to have crazy people around her, you know, to do the things we do. Because she just bothered me. And we don't have no money to pay for the house we left at that <laughs> And we're paying rent down here. And now we got this property. What if, what if we don't have no money to pay for this? Blah, blah, blah. Well, we did it all by faith. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you got something God is telling you, don't sit there and say you can't afford it. That's the least thing you got to worry God will provide. He's your holy child. Yes. When we got in this meeting, we realized we didn't even know because they did it residential because we couldn't get commercial and all this kind of stuff. But we, we got zoned for commercial afterwards. That was another big thing to do. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, when we were in there, that's when we found out it was 16 acres, not just that house up in front. 
Hallelujah. It goes all the way back to Aaron. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then they had to reduce the price because for some reason, as residential, they didn't appraise for enough money. So they cut the, cut the price by $40,000. I wanted to share that with you on your 14th anniversary because God made a way of this church. Yes. We are not in debt. My wife and I have paid for the land that turns automatically over to the church when we finish paying for it. But the church has no debt. Zero debt. We have never taken anything from this church for our ministry or for nothing else. The papers are written that way. And I want to tell you that since we started this church, when we had no money, we've been blessed Hallelujah. so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I cannot count the blessings if I try. Hallelujah. Yes. We just been, it just been an overflow Hallelujah. of blessing from God. So I want to tell you, you can start off with zero, but if you're faithful to God, He can make it work for you. Hallelujah. Yes. Please listen to me. This is not a testimony that only I can tell you in this church. We have people sitting here who can tell you too. Trust the Lord. Trust him. He will heal you. He will deliver you. He's not going to come out of the sky and just come and do something miraculous like part the Red Sea for you. But he does something quietly by his spirit. He can change your situation. He can make it work out for you. Trust him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And make this your home. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Lord. You know, uh, today we got cake, so after church we're going to go back and eat cake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't want the cake, cut it anyway and take it home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. She's like, you know, I'm not going to eat no cake. So how many of you got 6 o'clock starting Monday? You're not going to eat after 6 o'clock starting Monday. Yes. Don't cheat, Pam. I see you. <laughs> Already I can see it on her face. Bruce. You come back and tell me, and I know you will. That's one thing about Bruce and Pam, they tell on each other. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy, we're going to read a chapter in Timothy, and it's not going to be long, but I want you to think of something that is such the most wonderful thing that God did. Most wonderful thing that God did for us. This young man, Timothy, reminds me of the young man, my boys, and your young men and your family, Neon, all the young men, Scooter, reminds me of the young men in our church a lot, Timothy. But Timothy was a, man, a young man of faith. He understood authority and obedience. He did what Paul told him to do. That's one thing that's missing in our society today. We don't have a sense of obeying anything. We don't obey the government. We don't obey our parents. We don't obey the church. We all got our own way of thinking about everything. Yeah. We're researching on the internet. That's how we know everything. But you know, you know, in God's house, what makes his house work is authority that flows straight on down. God doesn't play with authority. As you know, every time Israel stepped from under authority, they were in trouble with God. The scripture even says, and we were sitting out talking about it the other day, Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. People wonder how witchcraft can work. It can work when you're in rebellion. You don't submit to no authority. We have an authority in this church that flows down. The people at the top are the servants. They're not the people who run things. They serve everybody else. Yes, sir. And so you have to flow with that authority because they're making a sacrifice to do things just for you. If they're doing it for money, then they're not really servants. But if they're doing it for you, they're servants of the living God. Yes, and so you obey that authority as they obey God. Some of you have got your own way of doing everything. Parents don't understand. Grandparents don't understand. Pastors don't understand. The scripture doesn't really mean what it says. Oh, it means everything that it says. Yes, everything. Whether you like it or don't like it. Well, I like it or don't like it. That was a time when I actually tried to change it when I was lost. I was doing too much in that book that they say was wrong. So I tried to figure out, well, maybe God don't mean that. <laughs> but he meant everything he said, didn't he? Yes, I don't care how sinful the world gets, how bad it gets for you. Everything God said is true. Yes. Whether you understand it, whether you accept it, whether you live it or not. Right. Timothy was a young man who understood that principle. 
Paul could trust him with the most wonderful thing Paul did was his churches that he had established for God. The Ephesian church was dear to his heart. He took that young man. He knew his time was short. He told that young man, I want you to take care of the church that I've been beaten for, thrown out for, for the gospel that I preach there. And I want you to keep it in the faith. I trust you, Timothy, yes, to do that. And he gave over his precious sheep to Timothy and said, you know, I don't have that long. But you fight the good fight. And you take care. I can trust Timothy. He's dear to me. Because Timothy knows how to obey authority. And he left that Ephesian church over to Timothy. And he gave him a charge. Because there were some people around Timothy and around the Ephesian church who had other doctrines. Other ideas how things ought to work. Other ways that the preacher ought to preach. Other things other than what Paul taught them was the charge of the church of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. And these men taught false doctrine. And they taught things that Paul didn't instill in the Ephesian church or in Timothy. And they taught these things and Paul was just not happy with that. But he could trust Timothy to keep those dogs those apostates from changing what he had almost died for and what God had established. You got to fight for your doctrine. You got to fight for the truth of the gospel. Paul was willing to send a young man and equip him and trust him to do that. Yeah. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 Timothy. I want, to, want you to read with me. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, not by the command of man, but by the command of who? God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true son in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is what? Love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that uh, law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for self-slave, for slave traders, and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to, do, to, to his service. Even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I want you to remember this verse. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the pro prophecies once made about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Today, I'm hoping that you can see that every church has a charge. And believe it or not, the charge is the same thing. It's to preach the gospel of the living God. It is to speak and preach and, and talk and teach. I'll say that once, I'll say it again. Over and over again, I don't care how tired you get to hear it, that this gospel of Jesus Christ is not about the law and legalism. It's about grace. King James called that verse where Paul talks about in verse 14, abundant grace, overflowing grace. I call it rain from heaven. Abundant grace, overflowing grace is this message. I, I see this young man who was a Greek, who they had to circumcise just to please a grown man circumcised. I fully understand. Just to please the religious. This is what had to be done to him. I hope you don't know, think they had anesthesia. But just to please them and the Jews, he had to be circumcised to preach the gospel because the Jews claimed Christianity for themselves and for their religion. Paul, called to be an apostle, had to reject his Jewish ways. He was a, he was a devout Jew, one that persecuted Christians, a violent man. Me and you will call him evil today. But he knew something about himself. And he accepted how wicked he was. But what he knew is that one day Christ came into his life. And suddenly the grace of God came upon him. Didn't matter what he was anymore. It's what he should be. I want to explain to you this overflowing grace of God. There is no words for it. You think you have to do something. You think you have to, you have to go to the Pope, or you have to go say a rosary, or you gotta say this prayer, or you gotta have a certain ritual. But you have been saved by grace. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care how wicked you were, Paul said. I was a blasphemer because of my unbelief. He said, I was ignorant of the truth. God's grace opened my eyes. And he gave me faith to believe. A faith I didn't even have. He gave it to me. He's telling this young man, Timothy, I want you to hold on to what we have preached. This gospel is not about man's doctrine. It's not about how you can have abundance of things in this earth. It's about grace of God. It's about stepping out of wickedness and walking into grace. Yes. It's not about earning nothing, working for nothing, striving for nothing, learning nothing. It's about receiving something yes. called grace. Yes. Oh, what makes this such a wonderful thing and a great message for our anniversary is that I too was once lost overburdened by sin. And one day, I just had this supernatural move that gave me this grace. And the Jesus that I had known all my life became real to me. Yes, I didn't earn it by my prayers or my confirmation or my baptism. I didn't earn it by my penance. He just came into my and when that grace was poured out upon me, I was never the same again. I didn't leave the grace on the table. Every day, I lived by grace. My Lord, my Lord. A person who lives by grace never think they deserve anything. Never think anyone owes them anything. It's not easily offended about anything because they know that they too live in this place of grace, they can give it to anybody. They got it freely. 
they can give it freely. Grace is flowing right now as I speak upon you as you hear the true gospel. Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. No man is saved by the law. He's saved by grace. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're not saved by your religion. You're saved by grace. Yes, sir. People talk about PKs. We've got a few of them in here. And they, they, they wonder why they have it so hard. And why they got to go through so much. And why people just study and look at every little thing they do. And criticize. Pastors go through the same thing. I, I'm probably the most criticized person in the church today. Not too many people are bold enough to do it in my face. Some are. But one thing my children had to learn and other children in this church had to learn, you don't deserve nothing just because you were raised a certain way. You got to find grace for yourself. Mom and daddy can help you, but until you learn how wonderful this place of grace is, you're going to always be living in your sins. You're going to always think of who you, who you think you are and who your friends say you are and who some pastor who taught you the wrong thing told you. But it's time for you to say, you know what? This grace is a marvelous thing. Yes. It's something I can't comprehend, but I sure want to receive. We need to tell our children, stop thinking you have to live any way. Just struggle all the time. Do you know that Jesus did it all for you already? Just step into grace today. It's being poured out as I speak upon you and upon me. Just like rain from heaven. His grace is there for me. If I got to wake up in the morning worried about whether I'm going to go home when he comes, I don't understand grace. That grace tells me all I got to do is believe and have faith and a good conscience and a good heart. And I don't have to struggle about nothing. I can wait and be anxious for him to come. Because grace abounds. The Ephesian church, just to shorten it a little bit for you, in Revelation, is the first church that John writes that letter to. That's how important this church was. And in that message, you can look at it later, not today, John, in Revelation 1, 2. That Ephesian church, where Timothy was assigned to keep the false doctrine out. In that, the scripture says, the Lord told him, give this letter to the Ephesian church. What are the seven churches in Revelation? Say that. You tell them that they have done a good work. They've kept those false people out of there. They really kept them out. They kept false teaching out. You'd be surprised how many people have left your church in 14 years who came in here with nonsense. Mm -hmm. And you said, Pastor, you put them out? No, I have never put a person out of this church. I'm not as bold as Paul, and it ain't my church. God put them out. They left. Because we will not change what we preach. Come on, Jesus. We will not change what God has given us to do. Yes. We're not worried about what some church teach about how you can get rich. I'm not worried about some church who just help all the poor all the time and they say they don't get nothing for it. I'm just worried about a church that tells me about Jesus. Yes. And we're going to stay in the faith. Yes. But in the book of Revelation, Timothy did his job. You, you'll know it when you read it. He, he kept them from false doctrines. But then Jesus told him. He said, but I do have this problem with you. You've left your first love. And I struggled with that. I said, God, such a great church. How did they leave their first love? We are so judgmental. We don't know. We always question how people get in the mess they in. I still say, God, give them grace for What's the religious part of us, you know? We always think people deserve what they get. They got to die. Ain't nobody deserve nothing. Christ wants everyone to have that grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray for Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, for me, man. 
But I love Mr. Baker. Because God's grace abounds on Mr. Baker so much. What does it mean, sir? You got a good wife. You mean? Give him this tape. Give him a look at it. I pray for him all the time, every day. Yes, come on, Jesus. Because I see God's grace on him, and he sees it on me. Hallelujah. 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 I think that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Don't you yes. think? Yes. That we can look at each other and say, oh, Pastor, just Pastor, that, but I love Pastor. Come on, Jesus. Because you see the grace of God. Hallelujah. I love you because I see all that grace in this room right now. There's yes. grace everywhere. Hallelujah. How can anyone put anyone down when they see all that grace God has given? Yes. It's a beautiful thing when you receive it and you can see it in others. Yes. The Ephesian church left their first love. And so I looked and I said, God, when did they do that? And why are they in the book of Revelation? And I want you to turn with me just for a second to Matthew 24. Keep your finger at Timothy. Ah! Oh, and I wonder, what is it they left? Well, everybody says they stopped loving Jesus as much. Some say they stopped loving each other that much. But in these last days, that's why these churches were in Revelation, because we're in those days. In Matthew 24, God talks about the last days. And he, specifically Christ, is talking. And he says, one thing, and i got to look for it, help me. Uh, I'll be there in a minute. Matthew 24 is all about eschatology, they call it, which is nothing but a fancy word for the last days, that Christ may come any moment. So when the preacher gets up there, he's all fancy, he says, I want to talk about eschatology. You just say, oh, you mean the last days. <laughs> Why didn't you just say that, Brad? <laughs> Today and I told you I was going to be. In Matthew 24, in verse 12, it says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You see, you and I live in times where wickedness is increasing. The Ephesian church, you can tell by what Paul had to assign Timothy to, had wickedness increasing. False doctrine, liars, perverts, all kinds of stuff going on. That remind, that remind you of anything today? Yeah. Where sin abounds, though, grace, grace does much more abound. Yes. And what the Ephesian church had to remember, those things are getting worse and worse. And sin is abounding everywhere I look. I can't turn the TV on. I can't watch a movie without sin being everywhere. Yes. Don't let your love wax cold. Hold on to grace. Because that's the time when God's pouring out even more grace. Yes. Don't judge it. Don't worry about it. And don't tell people, oh, you should go sinful thing. You can't come to church. Say, no, come to church because that's where grace is. Yes. Yes, sir. Don't you put nobody down because sin is increasing. Yes, it's increasing. But you still walk in love. And you don't need your first love because sin is all around you. You keep love. And you keep love. And you keep love. Because you don't deserve nothing yourself but grace. Yes, sir. Don't you forget your first love. The love that God poured out in his own flesh to claim you. You didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. It's that same grace that you have applied. To all that sin you see around you. Grace, grace, more grace. Hallelujah. Today, I want you to overflow with the grace that's been poured out on you. Hallelujah. I want you to show that grace to those around you. <coughs> I want you not to expect nothing from anybody but God's grace. Yes. I don't want you to say, oh, look at all the most sinful people. See, the church has really hurt us bad in the world. They've been so judgmental. <coughs> Telling you this is wrong, that is wrong. You know, like a catechism. 
This is mortal sin. This is evil. Yes. But grace does much more abound in the midst of sin. I gotta preach grace. Yes, sir. Because this is the gospel. There is no greater doctrine than grace. Yes, Hallelujah. People are wandering and preaching every day about this person's lifestyle, that person's sin, and this thing and that thing. And all they need to do is say, God loves you. And yeah. grace is available for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, that's not condoning sin. That's saying that if just like Paul, if he was a murderer, a blasphemer, and suddenly God's grace came on him and he changed, then how come they can't change? That's the gospel you need to preach. A gospel that says, if God's grace can change me, if God's grace can change Paul, it can change anybody. But we're so quick to judge. We're so quick to put them down. He said, come on to church with me. Oh, well, I can't go to church. I just saw a man dressed to the teeth. Came right out of the saloon, dressed for church. My first little religious self said, you know, I need to, I know that man. I need to tell him. You ain't got to really be in that bar and dress for church. But grace. Grace is in the bars. Grace is everywhere. We got to stop looking at outward appearance. Just preach a little grace. Yes. We gotta stop putting people down. Don't we? Pop, hey. Just pour out a little grace. That's what I like about chapter two is chapter. Because we all here by grace. Yes. There's nobody here can boast. I know all y'all. Some of y'all act bold. But I say I know all y'all. And you've been brought here by grace. Hallelujah. And you should live by grace. Hallelujah. And you should give that grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If there's anything on this anniversary, I'd like to tell you. Don't you forget your first love. It's about grace. It's about grace and more grace. Don't you put them down. Just say, God, give them something. Yes. 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 Don't just look at their sins. Mm -hmm. Ask God for grace. Yes. Yes, sir. Don't turn your back on them. No, no, no. Just ask God. Give them grace. Yes. Give them grace. Yes. Overflowing grace. Yes. Let grace fall that rain yes. in this church today. Because it's the grace that saved me. Yes. It's the grace that saved me. It's the grace that will save the world. Yes. Today, you want revival? You need to walk in that grace. Yes. Don't let all them TV programs say about all these people's sins and worry your nerves. Yes. Judging people. That's that religious spirit. That's because you don't forgot where you came from. Yes. Wow. Come on, Jesus. You tell the Holy Spirit. <laughs> But I want you to remember the wretched creature we all were. Some of us had it in a big pot, like me. It was no doubt I was wretched. Nobody had to guess. We've been known there a long time. And on heart, she's saying, hmm? you just better not tell them all the sins you had. <laughs> but we both were saved by grace. She was six months before me. And we married in grace. Hallelujah. And we live in grace. Hallelujah. And this church is grace. I go home in grace. Grace that started me will bring me all the way home. Hallelujah. All the way bring me home. Today, I want you to say, you know what, God, forgive me for judging people. Forgive me for judging myself so hard. It took me so long to come to the church. I have people who don't come to church because they've been drinking. They don't understand grace. I want them to know that somebody told them way back, you're an alcoholic, you're a drinker. You ain't got no business in the church. You tell them, come to chop to the church. Somebody told me, some of the people that you got up in that church up there, they be hanging at the dream club. So I decided. 
decided we'll visit the Dream Club one day. Come on. I had a good time, baby. No. I grew up in a club like that. Steph and I were driving back from Ruston the other day, and she saw this group. We, we drove to Scenic Rock through Utica, Mississippi. And that was this place, this big old red building. And I told her, I said, oh, that was, that's a club. That's a saloon. She said, Dad, what? That ain't no place. And we passed by that. Sure enough, it was a bar. <laughs> How you know that, Dad? I used to jerk in them places. <laughs> I know just what they look like. In the country, I know them buildings from a mile away. They all got them quick buildings, them little stone buildings. They all got them loud colors and lots of land to park around. <laughs> and God for grace. Can anybody judge me this morning? Can we judge anybody sitting next to you? No. We've been saved by grace. Yes, it's getting more simple. That's what the Bible said it would do. People's hearts are waxing cold. Don't you do that. Keep the fire hot. Let grace rain in your life. Let you be a giver of grace. If you receive it, give it. Today, I want you to bow your head. Down the Lord's choir has a particular song about what I just preached. You do get one of them. But what I want you to know, that that song y'all sing all the time, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You just sing it, but you better know it. It's overflowing on you. Right now as I speak, you're looking at your life and you're thinking, what if I die today? And God said, I got something for you today. I have something that's been hid for the ages. Oh, I had to bring the law out first so everybody can know what sin was. But I had something waiting for you all along. And in those days when Christ came, he rebuilt it in the kingdom of God. Grace and truth. Jesus Christ. Today, I'm fired up for grace. That to whom much has been given, much is required. I have been saved by grace. So have you. And you need to have that kind of joy in your day. That if I had to save myself, I'd still be going to hell. Because one letter of the law, that's all I got to break. One. It's not good enough for God. But that grace, that came, it overflowed me. I had to change that day. Because grace came on me so much. And all I could do is remember my sin. But I didn't want to do it no more. I took that grace. I ran with that grace. I live every day in that grace. How many of y'all was once lost? You didn't choose him. He chose you. How many of y'all never knew this church existed, but you came and you found God's grace in the house of the Lord? And you said, Father, this is what I've been looking for. A place where
God saved me will save my children, my grandchildren, my neighbor, my friend, my mama, my daddy, my brothers, my sisters. That's that grace. It abounds in the name of Jesus. Today, if you say, Pastor, I don't understand this thing called grace. I'm still living in my sins because I see no way out. Somehow you think there's no way out when God said, oh, yes, it is. I made a way out of no way. Just when you thought your wretchedness would last a lifetime, grace was there for you all along. Just when somebody told you you were no good, God said, oh, yes, no one's good but the Father. But I have grace for you. If you're in here and you believe, Pastor, I just can't receive grace. I've been born in penance. I've been born with shame. I've been born knowing the law, but I never understood the freedom that comes with grace. Today, I'm going to ask you to come up. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to send someone to you. You say, Pastor, this thing called grace, I haven't received it like I should. I still feel guilty. My conscience is not like Timothy good conscience. My conscience tells me I'm not right with God. And Paul told that young man, faith, love, and good conscience is your real assurance. If your conscience says you're dealing with something and you don't feel like God's grace can cover it, can remove the guilt, the condemnation, won't you raise your hand? I said, someone saved by grace to you that they may pray with you. And you say, God, I want the complete feeling of grace this morning. I don't want not even a sign, not even a little bit that I'm wretched, that I'm ashamed, that I can't change. I want a clean conscience this morning. How many of you will raise your hand? Raise your hand. I send one, send one to you. Hallelujah. If you want to come up, you can come up. But don't leave here without this falling on you. You know, some altar calls is a call of your heart. The day I got saved, I was sitting at a table. I never moved. But my tears could fill cups. I wasn't a crier, but I had many tears to shed. But I knew what had happened to me. My conscience was washed by my tears. And today, let yours wash you right where you are. Say, God, give me that grace today. Say it in your heart. I don't care. Let me just say, if you already think you got that grace, you ain't got no grace. You always want more grace. Yes, yes. It's an endless fountain. Come on, Jesus. Drink it every day. Yes, Lord. Live in it. Come on, Jesus. Jesus. Talk in it. Give it. Grace. Almighty Father, these are your people standing. Come on, sit. You know that your son died for every man and woman in here. Every child in the nursery. Every child at home. Every child in your heart. Every grandchild. Every mother. Today, Lord. Pour out your grace this evening, this afternoon. Pour it out on us that we may give it to those around us and share the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That I have been made free by the blood of the Lamb. That my conscience is clean, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That I will live by this grace today. When I leave today, I will walk out with abundance of grace on me. And I know that grace will bring me home. I know that grace will bring me all the way. In the name of Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, I pray that you step out that door. Full of grace. Washed and clean. Ready to share that grace with all those around you. 
This is the word of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No other doctrine. Say no other doctrine. No other doctrine. Gives me grace. Gives me grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you be blessed. And tell somebody, let it all be about grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All about grace. All about grace.